Hi, I'm Marcia Somerville, author of Tapestry of Grace. Welcome to Session 2 of our Tapestry Teachers Training Collection entitled Lesson Planning 101. In case you're new to this series, this second session works hand in glove with our Session 1, which was entitled Out of the Shrink Wrap. That session gave detailed information about setting up file folder and notebook systems to manage the physical elements of our homeschools, with an emphasis on how to organize tapestry materials in particular with such systems. We talked in a general way about tapestry pages that one would generate during most weekly planning sessions and how to manage them, and I highly recommend that you take the time at some point to listen to that sister session as soon as you can. In this session, we're going to dive into the details of choosing actual lesson content from Tapestry Year Plans, and I'll be role-playing what it's like to produce the papers while planning that then get filed into your new folder system. Both of these Tapestry teacher training sessions are excellent aids for new Tapestry moms, but they're also great sources of refreshment and review for our returning Tapestry veterans. But I know that for myself, I can't review too often because almost always when I listen to teaching on a familiar subject, I hear something new that refreshes or encourages me. So veterans, welcome, and new moms, welcome even more. I hope this session will prove helpful to you. Tapestry of Grace is a highly flexible guide that serves all learning levels, K-12 through plus us moms, with teaching and learning strategies taken from a variety of modalities. There are ideas for visual, tactile, and auditory learning for each child in your family. This means that Tapestry gives you more ideas for each week's schooling than you or your students will be able to use. I firmly believe that no curriculum provider can write a program that will serve the wide and wonderful variety of age levels, family dynamics, or academic goals that make up the homeschool community without some adjustments. On the other hand, in designing tapestry, I recognize that we busy homeschool moms need to be given real help. We need a method that is streamlined as much as possible so that we can plan lessons easily and quickly. Believe me, Tapestry was written by a mom of six, me, who desperately needed help and, at one point, told her husband, this is where we quit homeschooling. I do understand that busy moms need hand-holding, and that's why Tapestry of Grace is designed such that you choose the lesson content for your students and the teaching strategies for yourself, but you do so week in and week out within a standard structure that, with practice, makes planning meaty, effective lessons as easy and fast as possible for you. Now, because I was committed to open-ended flexibility in developing tapestry plans, a year's worth of work for everyone in your home, including you, on 12 levels, works out to be 36 hefty week plans. There truly is a lot here, but new moms... The way to not feel overwhelmed in looking at it is to understand its structure and the reasons why there's more than enough here. For each subject, Tapestry gives you suggestions formatted as weekly assignments that you and your children will break down into bite-sized ones and arrange in daily assignment charts. You'll choose some ideas over others. And this is why many newcomers who've been used to daily lesson plans that are pre-done for them wonder how best to begin with Tapestry. And that's what we're here for today. But before you can do this effectively, we need to take some time to deeply explore a framework into which you're going to pour your daily lesson contents. I need to walk you through a process for identifying the natural rhythms of your unique family and then allow you to develop a weekly schedule that is your very own. In this session, we're going to get into the small details of daily lessons using a copy of week two from year one about Egypt in the DE format, and I'll be role-playing an actual lesson planning session. That's the same process whether you're using tapestry in printed or DE formats. But first, let's construct this framework that I'm talking about for arriving at your weekly lesson schedule by tackling some basic concepts that form the foundation of all homeschool lesson planning. When we begin the planning process, it is so tempting to open up whatever new curriculum we're using and start with the academic content. But hold on, there's important groundwork to lay first. Before we can get into the academics, we need to understand our general family schedule really well. It will determine the patterns of our lessons weekly, which will in turn dictate the length and content of the academic work we assign. Each year, Our children grow and our family dynamics change. Therefore, 
Each year, wise women start the planning process by pulling out, rising, if you will, to 30,000 feet above their daily lives and assessing anew the unique strengths and weaknesses that they have as teachers, their unique family structure, the ages of their kids, the possibility of a new baby on the way, etc., and noting the general constraints that they simply can't work around that form God's perfect sovereign will for their lives. In other words, we moms need to take time to get a handle on our family's unique rhythms before we can crack open the curriculum materials. The best way that I've found to go about doing this is to grab an hour or more of uninterrupted time and take a pencil and a pad of paper with which to take notes as I consider a series of factors. Let me share my process with you. The first thing I do is to draw a chart. In it, I list my children's names across the top of the page. Then, I list the disciplines that I'm interested in having them learn in the coming year. History, science, math, foreign language, art, gym, maybe even some skills, such as cleaning a bathroom or learning to do the laundry. For each school-age child, I then assess the following. What learning level are they currently working at, and how will that change next year? What's their learning style? Does this child learn each subject best by reading, listening, or doing, or perhaps a unique combination of all of these? How much schoolwork and how many chores are they able to do independently, and how much do they need me to either read or sit with them while they're doing their lesson, or, as in the case with older students, how much do they need me to have discussions about their work with them? As I muse, I'm filling in specifics for each subject for each child. I think, can any of the older students, ideally those in the dialectic or junior high level, help with any of the teaching tasks in the year ahead, such as can some of them maybe do read-alouds for younger siblings, or grade some math papers, or sit with some of the little ones who are squirmy and need someone sitting with them to keep them on task, or can any of them mind babies while I do the teaching of upper-level students? So I sit and I think about these things and I make notes as things occur to me. Good. Now I put that aside and I take out a blank weekly schedule just with times on it as you see on your screen. Week to week, on average, I need to assess my family's usable academic hours. So I start with the beginning of each day. At what hours do my children normally arise? Are we early morning people, or realistically, does our day start a bit later than some other families that we know? For instance, no matter how much I might admire the Smiths' early start time each day, up at the crack of dawn and doing family devotions, if our children are later risers, or if my husband doesn't depart for work before, say, 9 o'clock each morning, chances are I'm fighting a natural, God-ordained rhythm if I write down that my schedule is going to start each day at 6 a.m., and so I'm setting myself up for failure. Now I consider other factors that affect when we have school hours, and I start making notes into the schedule. Do we have morning tasks that I must take into account, such as maybe we live on a farm that demands daily morning chores, or dad works the swing shift and he's only available to have time with the children in the mornings, or maybe there's a handicapped child in the house who needs morning medications given, and that always makes me a bit later in starting my day. Here's another question. At what learning levels are most of my children in the coming year? Families with all grammar level children will function much differently than ones with all older kiddos or with a wide range of students on various levels. If you have children, for instance, on various levels, you're going to have to be more structured in your overall schedule in order to get all the lessons that you need to teach each child done. Whereas if you have only grammar age children and toddlers to work with, often you're done by noon And there's no real structure involved in getting the lessons done in any certain order during each given day. If there are toddlers or babies to consider, what kinds of activities can keep them busy? And at what stage of the day do they need naps? I can't very well plan four straight hours of teaching lessons if I have toddlers and babies to care for without making some kind of plan regarding them. Probably I can't do it at all. So I need to make room. I need to make my schedule realistic the schedule that reflects my unique family structure. Here's another question. Are there classes that your older high schooler must take outside the home or online because you're not qualified to teach them? If so, when those do meet, 
How much time will be taken out of teaching and learning time for younger siblings if you must do the driving to and from these classes? Here's another one. Do your unique values commit you to large blocks of time that are non-academic? For instance, do you play music together as a family and have a priority of spending hours of instrument practice weekly? Or does your family prioritize sports practices and games at certain parts of the day or seasons of the year? Taking these commitments into account, which hours will then be available for academic work, and is the balance that you're seeing on your paper the one that you're committed to, or do you need some adjustments? Here's another question. Will you or your children be using any evening hours or weekend time to do homeschooling? If so, you need to fill that into the schedule. Do your church commitments require you to be out of the home during some hours that other families might devote to homeschooling, during the weekday, for instance, or on weekends? What about evening meetings that mean that children will want to sleep late the next day on school nights? Are you involved with a co-op that dictates when certain lessons are to be taught? For instance, if your co-op meets on Wednesdays and students will have to do their history in time to talk about it in a discussion format on that day, then you're going to need to plan the history reading for Monday and Tuesday. If you need to teach older children this year using tapestry, when will you hold the needed discussions for various subjects like history, literature, and church history? And what should the little people in your house be doing while you're having those discussions? Now, filling in this chart can be really eye-opening. I know it was for me each year. Having seen the big picture, from using questions such as these, you may need to stand back and look at the available teaching hours and do some adjusting. It's an inescapable fact that high schoolers will simply have to have about seven hours per major academic subject, and there are usually five of those, to use for a combination of independent and discussion time. Younger students will need proportionately less, down to a first grader who probably needs about two or three hours a day at the most of time actually doing lesson work. If you've honestly answered the questions above and filled in a sample schedule, of your basic weekly commitments and the ones that you anticipate for the next academic year and you find that your family has so many commitments that there really aren't enough hours in which to get your lessons done then it's time for a conversation with your husband and let me tell you why you need to talk to him next. Put as simply as I know women are prone to overcommitting and discouragement. As women we're very often tempted to compare ourselves and our children with others. Sometimes the example of others is given to us by God to inspire us, but more often we women fall into striving or discouragement when we behold all the beautiful hands-on projects or creative lesson plans or the number of academic classes that our neighbors both nearby and on the internet are doing. As we enter our planning times, we're prone to either redouble our efforts and overcommit or simply sink beneath the weight of whispering guilty voices about all the should-dos and can't-dos of our busy lives. Satan can really have a field day with us at this point. There's always more that we can do. There's always more that we should do. There's always something that we've left undone in the recent past. It's such a slippery slope. So let me remind you of one of your greatest God-given secret weapons against such woes while you're doing your big picture planning, and that's your husband. I don't think we women can hear too often that God gave us husbands as a covering. We women get wound up in sinful comparisons, striving, as contrasted with laboring, for excellence in all areas, worries about performance for our kids, etc., Husbands are there to give us our personal plumb lines, and the more we turn to them with our questions and concerns, the better they're able to help us. I know many homeschooling moms who dismiss their husband's input when doing homeschool planning because, quote, he's not into the details, end quote, or he earns the money and I do the teaching, or he doesn't teach the kids so he can't understand the question I'm facing, let alone give me a decent answer. It's not that we don't respect our husband's we think. It's just that, bless them, this isn't their area of strength, and no wonder. They're breadwinners, not homeschool teachers. Well, I used to think that way until one year the Lord impressed on my heart that since Scott, my husband, had been given to me as my head, leader, and protector, I should ask him for his direction at any time in the year ahead where I felt concerned, anxious, fretful, or overwhelmed. I knew I needed help, and the Bible taught me that Scott was supposed to lead our family. 
I reasoned that if God had given me Scott for my head, God would give him answers for me. Whatever Scott said, I determined that I would simply treat as God speaking audibly to me, and I would heed Scott's words as if Jesus himself had spoken them to me. Now, what I found out when I tried this experiment really surprised me, and I share it with you today in hopes of encouraging you. As I was faithful to trust God that year and submit myself to my husband's leading despite my doubts about his capabilities in giving me sound leadership in the details of homeschooling, I learned that Scott didn't really need to understand the details in order to direct me. He was the leader, not the administrator of our homeschool. I would summarize my difficulty, and then he would line it up with his priorities for our family and give me direction. Generally speaking, as a couple, this wasn't really new for us. I've always been the administrative one, putting feet to Scott's visionary directives. The new part was a change in me, because... I have to admit that being administrative can make one arrogant, especially in our can-do American society, which so prizes achievement. When I decided to ignore my concerns about Scott's ability to master the details of my difficulties and see instead each and every one of his directions, whether or not I initially agreed with him, as God speaking to me directly through my husband, my life got vastly easier. Whatever Scott said, I could take as God's direction to me and ignore all the double-minded doubting and debating that had long raged in my head as I endlessly worked to be the perfect homeschool mother. There was so much joy and peace in our homeschool that year that I continued to walk in this manner for the rest of my homeschool days and to learn to do it in other areas as well. God is always glorified when we trust him. Submitting to Scott's leadership in homeschooling was a major act of trust in God that paid great dividends over the years. I love the internet and the wonderful groups of ladies that have formed through it for mutual encouragement and information sharing among homeschoolers, especially our tapestry community. We have some of the sweetest moms that ever breathed on our community websites. These Yahoo group ladies are full of great ideas, but keep in mind as you go to plan that they are just that. They are these ladies' ideas. You don't have to do each and all of the creative suggestions that fellow moms post to Yahoo groups, blogs, and tapestry forums. These should and can inspire us, but they should not become taskmasters to us. Tapestry alone, as written, With moms making choices between the assignments listed there and adding almost nothing to them has led many moms to have highly successful academic experiences over a wide variety of family settings without adding many bells and whistles at all. If God gives you the energy and the creativity to embellish your student's studies and your husband agrees to your plans, then go for it. But for those who perhaps feel weary and overburdened when they look at their sister's productivity, Can I just say that perhaps you're doing more than God and your husband would require of you? Ask God and your husband. They'll tell you the truth. And then rest in their direction. Ultimately, you're responsible to God first, your husband, and your children for the choices as a teacher that you make. So stick between the guardrails that God has given you when you feel the temptation to go off the road and beyond your comfort zone just because others are going there. Okay. Stepping out of the pulpit now and returning to our planning process, we see the need to identify a minimum number of hours in a week in which to accomplish the academic lessons and character building activities that we feel led to undergo for our family's sake. If our family commitments have become unbalanced, then we need to talk this over with our husbands. Saying no to sports or social opportunities or even church work for the sake of the greater yes, raising our children to the glory of God, takes courage and faith, and it takes the covering of our men. So go ahead and have that conversation, and once you've got a basic idea of the working schedule for the year ahead, you're ready to tackle specifics. Now, one more foundational principle, and then we'll get down into the details of Tapestry of Grace planning. Let me exhort you also to keep your eye on the goal and not the process as you begin planning next year's homeschool. What do I mean by goals? Goals are simple markers by which you can measure forward progress. If you fit the process to your goals, you won't get easily overwhelmed when you're making choices with Tapestry curricula. Therefore, your next step is to clearly identify measurable goals for the upcoming year for each student. To do this in the past, I developed a simple one-page form where I wrote for each student the academic, social, skill development, and spiritual goals that I had for him or her in very short phrases. 
Each year when I started to look over the academic materials that I'd purchased and planned the actual lessons, I'd start by establishing these goals first. Social. Needs to learn to speak more kindly to others and needs to learn to give up her desires to serve others more quickly and easily. That was my goal for this girl for the entire year. Spiritual. Grow in humility, kindness, and patience through seeing Jesus more clearly. We always want our children to grow through preaching the gospel. Academic. Bible. Survey as part of Tapestry of Grace Year 1 studies. History. Read all the Tapestry of Grace core readings and do one hands-on project a month as a minimum. Math. Finish Section 6-5 book and publish tests. Geography. Tapestry of Grace maps each week. Dictation. Faithfully complete this every day for one unit. Writing and Composition, Tapestry of Grace Writing Assignments as Given. Science, A. Becca, 6th grade text plus 4 projects this year plus published tests. Literature, Tapestry of Grace as Written. Spelling, Faithful Daily Use of Spelling Power, all year. Skills, Learn to Clean a Bathroom Thoroughly, Do Practice Piano Regularly, and Learn to Cook 2 New Company Meals Each Quarter. That's an example for a sixth grade girl for the entire year. Okay, now, having put first things first, we're ready to begin planning using tapestry materials. Let's start with taking a close look at what educators call modalities, which are the ways that people take in information. Basically, there are three ways that human beings learn, through their eyes, visual, through their ears, auditory, and through their touch, or experiences, tactile. Thinking about modalities while planning using tapestry materials and purposefully mixing them up within our units keeps school fresh and varied and helps us make choices between tapestry suggestions more easily. Recognizing this, each week tapestry offers you a variety of modalities that can be used to teach the self-same era of history. Thus, tapestry plans constitute a buffet of educational opportunities from which you choose. They're all good, and the menus that arise from the different moms' choices will look different for different families, even within your family and from child to child, as you would choose various foods from a buffet, meat, veggies, and fruits to grow strong bodies, so a healthy diet for the brain will contain information from a variety of modalities. Remember that, as with children's diets, more isn't always better. Sometimes it's just more. There really are no bad choices among the tapestry offerings, so don't be afraid to make your choices and stick with them wholeheartedly, even when your friends might be making different choices. Knowing that the modalities overlap helps you to feel that leaving out, for instance, a tactile approach to a week plan is okay if you've already chosen a visual one. Say, you're not going to make the project on building the pyramids because your kids are going to read a book about pyramids, and plus they're going to see a PBS movie about it instead. Just knowing this one feature of tapestry lesson planning makes it less intimidating to choose among the ideas that tapestry presents you with and makes choices more clear. As you peruse the week plan looking for specific assignments for your children, ask yourself, is this assignment a visual auditory or tactile approach, and what have we been doing a lot of so far? Then, try to mix it up. Now, I can hear some newer moms asking, what kinds of modalities do tapestry plans offer? I don't see these clearly. If you're new to this concept, you might need me to clarify. So here goes. For visual learning, there are, of course, the books. Reading and looking at pictures are key visual learning opportunities. We also recommend videos on page 5 of each week plan for added visual variety. There are many videos that can enliven history lessons. In addition to our suggestions, you can check PBS listings online, your public library shelves, and even your current home video collection for shows that go with the time period you're studying. And don't forget the internet. We have links to literally thousands of supported web pages that are fun for students to browse and help them to take a fresh approach to weekly topics. Now, auditory learning is offered mainly through discussions and read-alouds within tapestry. Some families who have strong auditory learners or children with busy schedules also find some of our recommended books on tape and allow students to listen to rather than read, especially literature and Bible survey assignments. 
For younger students, asking them to narrate back the content of a story or lesson adds auditory reinforcement to the learning experience as students hear themselves summarize what they've learned. Tactile learners enjoy tapestry greatly. Our plans offer tons of hands-on work. We suggest projects that help students experience aspects of the era that they're studying firsthand. Additionally, we ask them to label maps for geography work. We suggest that older students make their own detailed timelines. We offer lap books that reinforce each unit's lessons for grammar age students. And we suggest going on many field trips. Within our writing program, we suggest a variety of tactile applications such as creating speeches, arguing in debates, crafting newspapers, giving oral presentations, putting together state notebooks, and making display boards. Note in choosing modalities that ages play a role. Just as babies drink mostly milk, while adult athletes need lots of protein, modality balances change, too, as school careers progress. Younger students who are absorbing basic information and life experiences thrive on tactile learning. Dialectic students who are working hard to make connections should not be overburdened with too much written work, so we offer them visual aids and oral learning, as well as detailed readings. High school is the ramp to college studies for many young people. Their modalities are heavy on reading and composition. Remembering that your primary learning mode may be different from some, if not all, of your children, consider each child and the modalities that best suit him or her. Don't get stuck in the rut if you're an auditory learner of always lecturing to your children. Be sure to vary the modalities within your home school. Starting with the modality that you best understand and beginning with that the first week of your first unit, look at the suggestions that are offered. To use myself as an example, I learn best by either reading or listening. For almost all families, implementing tapestry means a rich reading list. So how do we plan and use it? On the Tapestry of Grace website, in the Explore section, there's a free 12-minute overview on the structure of our reading assignment charts, the hidden features of these charts that help you to plan, and the ways that you can most easily list and find books to borrow or buy when using tapestry. We think you'll find the information there helpful as you start to plan for your year. Now that you've figured out your weekly schedule for lessons, it's time for me to role play the planning of one week for two students. I'm going to pretend that it's summer and that I'm pre-planning week two of year one. Let's say that I only need to use the materials for upper grammar and dialectic students because I've got a daughter, Carla, who's in upper grammar and a son, Joey, who's in dialectic. The first thing I'm going to do is get to my week plan. Now, for DE users, that's going to look like what's on your screen. And obviously, for print-only customers, all the pages that I'm going to access here, you already have in print. So whenever I talk about printing, most of the time, you're going to already have them in print. So for DE customers, here's your interface. And I'm going to go to Unit 1, and I'm going to choose Week 2 because... That's the week that I'm starting to plan. Now, the minute that I choose week two, I'll have options down here of things that I can choose. The curriculum, I can choose writing aids, which I'll be doing later. I can choose map aids. And you can see that this area here is the slate. The slate keeps changing as I'm accessing different products. Now, if I haven't bought map aids, these links will be what we call dead. I won't be able to get to the documents that are here until I've purchased the product. But generally speaking, I can still work from it because it will show me the names of the maps, for instance, that I would print out even if I owned map aids. And it can help you because you can go to the internet and print down free maps, but they're just sometimes harder to find the exact maps that you really want. So let's start with curriculum. If I'm going to start planning for Carla and Joey, I'm going to start with the curriculum and I'm going to browse the full week plan. I'm going to open it up. Once it's opened, I'm going to start familiarizing myself with what is the topic of the week. The topic of the week is going to be at the top of the page, right here, Pharaohs and Pyramids. Now, because Carla is in upper grammar and Joey is in dialectic, I've actually been to Egypt before, and I know about Egyptian history, and so I'm going to kind of be a little bit familiar with what I'm doing here. The first thing I'm going to do is go to these threads. And I'm going to only be looking for the yellow, which is for Carla, the upper grammar, and the green, which is for Joey. I can completely ignore anything that's blue. 
And I need to also be looking at the purples because the purples are for all levels. If two levels are together like this, it just means that this information applies to both of these levels. But again, I'm not concerned with that too much. I'm just looking at what's for Carla and what's for Joey. So I look here and I say, okay, I read this through and I read this through and this gives me the general outline for what we're covering, the main ideas that we're covering in history for these two students. Then I can scroll down with my little hand here and I can look at the writing assignments. This basically says the same thing every week. It's just a reminder to be sure to do your writing. The literature, um, again, will remind me of things that I should remember about the literature. And then I'll keep going down. This picture reminds me of all the great tactile projects that I could probably use this week. And on this page, we continue with geography threads. I can look and see what they're doing. We're labeling major cities in ancient Egypt for Carla. And we are um, looking at the details um, about pyramids and the upper and lower kingdoms for Joey's level. And then for fine arts and activities, there's all kinds of good um, work always to be done with the Egyptians. This boy sure has had fun playing with hier hieroglyphics. So that's another inspiring picture that the good folks at Lampstand Press have put into tapestry to show me what I might do. Now I'm going to hop over here to the weekly overview. This is a two-page spread that shows me uh, what it is that, besides the reading, I'm going to be offered as options for my kids. And I can look at this as either this one-page spread, or I can actually go up to view, and I can tell it that I want it to be a two-page spread. Right here, I go to page layout, single, continuous, or facing. A facing layout is sometimes easier to see. I want to make it smaller so that I can view it on screen. And if I wanted to, I could close these bookmarks or at least make them smaller so that I have more space here. I like sometimes looking at the two pages um, as if they were sitting in my binder. Those of you with print only, you obviously can look at this in full, full size, no problems. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at this weekly overview chart and I can manipulate it around like this so that I can see it. And I'm gonna look to see, again, down at the bottom of all of these charts, this is the upper grammar column, and it's joined with the lower grammar right here, and this is the dialectic column, and in places it's joined with the rhetoric. It's joined here and it's joined here. So here on this page, I see student threads, which means simple uh, rewriting of the adult threads that were on the first few pages, basically similar information that my students could access if they wanted to. Here are some um, vocabulary words that I might use with Carla. Here are some dates that Joey might put on his timeline. Over here, um, there are activities. For Carla, we could learn to write hieroglyphics. We could make a model of King Tut's portrait mask. We can make personal clay cartouches. I might not know what a cartouche was if I hadn't had Joey through ancient Egypt four years ago. Joey's is to paint a wall frieze, make a paper mache mummy. Here are all kinds of ideas. If we had a co-op, these ideas would go for a co-op. And then this is the geography for each of them summarized for me. So having looked at these two and browsed them, I've got a pretty good idea of the modality that I can pick in planning this week. Now I'm going to close up these pages and close up the threads and I'm going to go next to the teacher's notes because I want to see what's going on. I'm going to go back up to view and page layout and I'm going to go to the continuous again so that I can scroll and I'm going to start in the first page of the teacher's notes which is always where the history background information starts. Now this background information is for all of the students in my home. This is my cheat sheet where I learn about all of the ideas that any of my kids might be covering this week. And I can just scroll through here when I'm starting to plan. If I really wanted to read this on screen I would simply um, extend it a little bit to be bigger. Something like 125% would be great. I could read it this way. Um, or I can print this out to read later, especially if I've never been in Upper Egypt before. I might really want to print this out later and read it um, at a doctor's appointment or in my own bed. I could add it to my teacher's working binder that we talked about in Out of the Shrink Wrap, our other session. So this is where the history um, background information is to be found. So after we scroll through here, it's just another way to scroll is over here. 
come down, I get to Joey's discussion outline. Now with Carla, I won't be discussing because um, Carla is in that stage of learning where she's just going to absorb uh, facts by doing and by reading and by listening. So she doesn't need a discussion session once a week, but Joey does. And so here's his discussion outline. And you can see it's telling me um, the order in which Tapestry is suggesting that I discuss his work with him this week. And we, as I browse through here, I see that what we're really talking about is some mythology. We're also talking about the seven wonders of the world. We're talking about some of the worldviews. Here's um, a, a part that catches my eye. Be sure that students stick closely to scripture in supporting their views of both Christian and Egyptian beliefs. Here are a few references for you to use. I'm probably going to print these pages out because I want to go over this. This is really important information. We're talking this week about mummies, pyramids, and pharaohs. And a lot of this is orientation um, about the Egyptian mythology and what they believed. As a matter of fact, if we jump down to page 47, this is the Bible Survey and Church History Rhetoric Discussion Outline. And it's all about helping me with talking to Joey about differences between the Christian worldview and the Egyptian one. And I'm going to need some help with that because it's been a long time since I really talked to Joey about that. And I'm going to need some help with that because I've never really been through talking through the worldviews with Joey. We just had a lot of fun with it the last time we went around to Egypt. So this time I've really got to get my game on to be able to discuss at his older age the um, aspect of his biblical survey and the worldview in the Bible versus what he's learning about Egyptian mythology. Of course, with Carla, I could skip Egyptian mythology altogether. But this outline here, even though it's for older kids, it's going to prepare me for teaching all of my kids and about how the Bible is more reliable than any opposing worldview. So that's helpful. Now that I'm oriented to the message of the week plan for both of my children, learning levels. I'm going to look up on the reading assignment charts and spend some time deciding exactly what books I really want to assign this week. So here I am. I'm going to go down here to remind myself of what the levels are. Each week in Tapestry, as you may have learned, here's the upper grammar. This is what Tapestry thinks one week for a median child in this learning level. And then this is Joey's column, is the green. So both of these children have um, different assignments in this week plan. And I'm looking, okay, the Usborne Internet Linked Encyclopedia is a book we've been reading all along. I definitely want her to do those pages. Okay, this book, Pyramid. I've never really looked at this book, Pyramid, seriously. It's an in-depth book, and I don't know if our budget's going to have room for this book. So I'm going to go ahead over to Bookshelf Central and see what I think. So the first thing that I need to do is go to Bookshelf Central and the way this website works is I'm going to choose my year, which is year one, and then I'm going to choose my unit, which is unit one, and then I'm going to choose my level, which is upper grammar, and then I'm going to choose my subject, which is history. And in the magic of software, I should scroll down and there's the book. So I can click on this book and I can read about the author. I can see how many weeks it's used. It's only used one week. Okay, new, it's going to cost me eight sixty, which is a competitive price with other new vendors online. Um, and if I want it, I'm going to go ahead and add to the cart and check out. So if I decide to use the book, then I'll go back to the reading assignment chart where I was, and I will go ahead and print out this page, and I will mark with little check marks uh, the reading assignments that I want my children to cover. This will be their, their literature. Uh, perhaps I won't buy these books on activities. Maybe I'll get them off the web for free. Um, so they may not use these books on fine arts. And then here is my Bible survey going along. They're going to have to read five chapters in Exodus. So if I want to, I can write in these assignments for them in their reading assignment charts. There's every week there are reading assignment charts um, actually, they're not just reading assignments. They're all kinds of assignments that are right here uh, connected to 
each week plan, and they are of various types. They cover things it, that different ages would cover. So I can leave these blank, and I can have the children fill them in when they come to their week, or as I'm going through my planning, I can fill this in for them. It's definitely a matter of preference for moms. The more you train your kids to fill these in from the tapestry book lists um, like this, the more that they get to be independent and own their own work. But that's entirely a matter of preference, and for newer moms, most of them will feel more comfortable printing this out and then even probably transferring it over to the assignment sheet. All right, having picked out my books, I'm now going to want to go to the student activity pages. And I'm going to want, especially for Carla, to look and see what kinds of um, things are being offered for her. So the way that I know that I'm in upper grammar is because down here in the corner of every page there's a color and I'm still following the yellow for Carla. So I'm seeing that they're offering me these ideas which we looked at on the weekly overview. Um, I can choose a project. Um, I might choose a project from ancient Egypt. I might use a grid technique to enlarge um, an Egyptian drawing. I might um, do other things from these websites that are linked to the tapestry website. I told you that those would be for free. Here's the geography that's being suggested. Um, there will be a map that I can print out from MapAids that she can fill in. Then in the Bible survey and church history, here's some questions that she can answer ahead of time. Her literature book is A Place in the Sun, and this week they are doing describing on what happens in each chapter. So this is summarizing what goes on in each chapter. If I want to, I don't have to have her write this in with penmanship. I could have her do this orally to me aloud, sort of to vary um, the modality. So if it's too much writing in one week, I could have her do this orally with me and just summarize what happens in each of the chapters that she read. Let's jump over and see what's going on for Joey. For Joey, there are accountability questions that prepare him for our discussion time, that discussion outline that I was showing you. So I definitely want to print this page off for him. Joey isn't really a fine arts kind of guy. Um, he doesn't do much tactile stuff. I'll probably ask him if he wants to get into any of these. The one thing that I can think of Joey doing is the paper mache mummy. That looks pretty cool. Um, other than that, I'm not sure he'll be interested in much of this. Um, but I can always ask him to see what he's up for. Here's his geography, and his literature is a bunch of, of questions. He doesn't have a literature worksheet this time. This is um, going along with his study of the Egyptian mythology and the worldview study this week. So it's a bunch of thinking questions and discussion questions rather than any kind of worksheet. And here's his Bible survey. So I'll print out these pages and stick them into the kids' planning uh, folders, or if I'm an energetic mom, I can come back to this page and I can go to something here called workbook contents. Workbook contents is a copy of the student activity pages that we were just viewing. And what this is, is that it has everything that we were just viewing in a style that I can cut and paste into my own Word document. So if I have a Word document up and I'd like to only take a few of these questions for Joey, I can highlight it um, and select it and I can then cut and paste it into a Word document. So let's say that I wanted to just do uh, this question, maybe these three questions for Joey. I could take them like this and I can copy them and I can paste them into a Word document and I can spread them out and in the very end I can make a workbook that's bound with just exactly what I want in it. If I only want him to do some of the geography I could just pick and choose which cities he was to look up. If I only wanted him to answer a couple of these thinking questions I could do that. I could choose out whichever ones I want and I can reformat them with space between them so that they can write there any of these things can be done um, using this section of the curriculum. So that's just something that a lot of moms should know about. Again, it's not necessary by any means. I generally, as a mom, would just print these things out and let them be used that way. But the choice is always yours. We give you the flexibility. Now, I just want to do a couple more things before I'm done planning here. I want to 
make sure that I print out the maps for this week. So I'm going to go back to my week two over here and I'm going to go to my map aids. And map aids has listed by color code, if you can see here the color codes, ancient Egypt and ancient Egypt, but they are two different ancient Egypt maps. So this is what the grammar map is looking like. I noticed that there are pre-drawn pyramids here that Carla will label and pre-drawn cities here. Let's look and see what Joey's map looks like. I'm going to close out this and I'm going to go and see what the one that's labeled with the green that I always look for for Joey. I'm going to see what that one looks like. Okay, so here's Joey's map and he'll have a little harder time because the dots won't be put in here for him. He has the little pyramids but not the dots to help him out with where the cities are. So he's going to work a little harder to label his map than Carla will have to. Now closing those out, the nice thing that I love about map aids is that here's an answer key that goes for all four learning levels. And this shows me the answers which means that I don't have to go looking for things in a very complicated atlas. I've got a very simple version of the map not only can I check my students' answers easily, but they can actually label their maps from this map if I want to work it that way because it is in its way an atlas and it's easier for them to find things on this kind of a map. Usually what I do is vary it back and forth. It depends on how obscure the things are that I'm looking for or that they're looking for when they're trying to do their map work. Okay, so that's I'm going to print out those maps as I go, as I look at them. I'll send each one of those to the printer. And then the next thing that I'm going to look at is evaluations. Now, for week two, so early in the year, actually, I'm not going to use evaluations to test my kids this week. Rather, I'm going to use them as reinforcement. I'm going to see how much they learned by the end of the week. So here's a green one. This is for Joey. And I could use this as a quiz. But I'd rather use it for a worksheet for him. He can fill in the relationships between the pyramids and how they related to pharaohs and the pharaohs and how they related to mummies and the mummies and how they related to pyramids. So you see this is showing the connections between these three things and this would be could be a quiz for him this week but I'm going to use it as a worksheet. Now the great thing again about having these evaluations is there's also an answer key for me. And I can use this for myself, or I can use this for Joey. Anything that's in italics are something that he could or should be able to get on his own from the week's lesson, having done the reading and the discussion that is offered by Tapestry of Grace Guides. The instructions that the introduction to evaluations gives parents is that they really don't need to quiz students more than two or three times a unit, but they give you quizzes every week. And I like to get my money's worth, so what I like to do is print down and use sheets like this for reinforcement exercises for the week's work. So that's just a little extra tip. The last thing that I have to do is to do writing. So I'm going to go back to the curriculum and I'm going to open the week plan again. And I'm going to go and peruse the writing assignments this time. Now my daughter Carla is in a level four because she's an upper grammar student. So I'm going to look at Carla's. We've been going along learning the parts of speech. So I see from this column here a summary of what she's going to do this week. She's going to be learning about pronouns this week. She's going to continue to review the steps of the writing process. And she's going to learn about pre-writing. So as I look through here, this is her assignment for this week. This is everything that she could, that I could have her do. Uh, what I noticed down here is that we're going to be starting to use graphic organizers. And my daughter is not particularly advanced for her age, so I have a choice of two paragraphs that she will start to organize her thoughts for. She's not going to write the paragraphs, she's just going to learn to use graphic organizers for them. And one is to pretend that she's a commoner in ancient Egypt and to describe how a king is important in Egyptian society. And the other one is to explain one of the burial customs of the ancient Egyptians and they're offering me the ideas of using the describing wheel and the simple cluster diagram. I think describing is something that we haven't done in a while and this only being the second week of the year I think describing would be a good thing to do for her. Now while I'm here I'm going to jump over to Joey's. Joey is a level 8 so I'm going to come down here to level 8 
and I'm going to see that he's also reviewing the steps in the writing process, obviously at a more advanced level, and he's also looking at reviewing and using graphic organizers, and he's got different um, paragraphs that he can write, describe the tomb of King Tut, or what do pharaohs, pyramids, and mummies have in common? Well, since I'm doing that review sheet, I'm not going to use the relationship diagram. It'll be easier for me if I teach them both describing. So I'm going to look for the describing tools back in the curriculum. I'm going to close out this page, and I'm going to go back to writing aids now. I'm going to look under level four, and here are the describing wheels. This describing wheel is a really simple one. So I'll be using this one for Carla. I'll print it out before I close it. Let's go look at Joey's level. Joey's level also has two describing wheels. Let's look at the other describing wheel. This one is more ornate, and I know it would keep Joey's interest better, so I'm definitely going to print this one out for Joey. Now, obviously, when they're getting ready to write their paragraphs, they're going to want to fill these quadrants in with something about what they're writing about, either about King Tut's tomb or about how the king is important in the society or whatever it is that I assign them to write. I might have them both describe King Tut's tomb and then they can kind of do the project together and build sibling camaraderie. So that's a way that I can tweak the assignment they gave me and jump off into my own creative bent with my own kids. Okay, so we're going to close out of here. So that pretty much finishes our planning for this session. And I thank you so much for joining us, and I hope that it's been helpful for you. God bless.